Hello, good evening. Um, welcome to Friday Night's Live from the parish. While we're still close to the public, we are very happy that we can still connect with our audiences through these Friday Night Lives program. And uh, I would like to thank our sponsors who make this possible. Our presenting sponsor, Bank of America, as well as Sandy and Stephen Perlbinder. It is my distinct pleasure tonight to welcome Tomashi Jackson, an artist I have been following for several years and that I'm really excited to be working with for a uh, project, an exhibition um, called The Land Claim, which was supposed to open this July and unfortunately had to be postponed due to the COVID-19 crisis and hopefully uh, will be shown next year. Um, I would like to uh, give you a brief introduction to Tomashi before we actually see her face. Um, Tomashi Jackson uh, is a multidisciplinary artist who works in painting, collage, sculpture, and video. She was born in Houston and raised in LA. She has an MFA in painting and printmaking from Yale University School of Art, a Master of Science in Art and Culture and Technology from MIT School of Architecture and Planning, and a BFA from Cooper Union. Tomashi is also an alumni of Skowhegan School of Painting and Culture. And she was in the 2019 Whitney Biennial. She was in group exhibitions at Mass MoCA and um, other museums and art institutions. Welcome Tomashi, are you with us? Hello, hi Tomashi. Thank you so much for having me. It's so great to have you. Um, I just wanna start by saying, um, while we are going through such a tremendous moment of grief and mourning uh, and also reckoning um, with all the racial injustice that has been going on in this country for centuries, um, we're all asking ourselves, how can we tell a painful story? How can we artists and art professionals be of service to those who are affected and how can we create change? Um, so Tomashi, it is a, a real pleasure to have you here. While we um, will explore our project that you're working on for the parish, which is um, entitled, entitled The Land Claim, and which really focuses on um, communities of color on the East End, uh, namely experiences, uh, lived experiences by uh, the Shinnecock Nation, um, black communities, and more recently communities um, from Latin America. Um, we have also decided that we would like to go through some of your um, more recent projects, which really explain your methodology, um, which shows the, the, the kind of work that you create. Um, and then we kind of pivot towards our project. So um, welcome, Tomashi. Thank you. Um, Corinne, can I just say that I love speaking with you and that our conversations um, well, our conversations have influenced what the what this work has become um, for the parish, and I also just enjoy speaking with you about about art and history and work. So, so I'm really I... excited to rejoin you after our last talk at Noya House in New York City. It's really a pleasure to be back in conversation with you. Thank you, and I really look forward to a whole series of talks with you and um, also some community. Uh, leaders and historians from the East End that have been really crucial in doing this research for, for your project. So um, let's get started. It's slideshow time. I also wanna say that webinars are weird because we can't see the people who are in the room. So hello everyone who's come to join us and thank you for coming. Thank you for making time for joining this conversation today. And we're interested in what your thoughts are. So please, if you have any questions as you as we go along, feel free to uh, type them out in the chat and um, and they may help anchor or uh, they may help provide the architecture for our, for our conversation later on. So thank you. All right, let's get going with the slides. A few more. Okay. Yeah, roll call in the chat. <laughs> Yes, and by the way, people who are watching, please um, send comments and questions in the Q&A section and the chat section at the bottom of your screen. We're um, happily um, going to address them or not, uh, depending on time and, um, and what, we, um, what we're talking about. Tomashi. Okay, yeah. Um, this first set of 
images uh, is from 2016. They began in, well, they began. This, this inquiry began uh, in the greater Boston area in 2014, and it culminated in the show, The Subliminal is Now, my first solo show at Tilton Gallery. Hi, Sandra Perry. Um, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, this was the last, this was, this was my, yeah, this was a great show. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, the subliminal is now is a no is a nod to uh, Barnett Newman's uh, "The Sublime Is Now." Um, so yeah, so this this body of work was inspired by uh, what I saw um, here in 2014 in Massachusetts. Uh, my best friend, uh, my best friend. Uh, my best friend was was working in education advocacy at the time, and my interest in visualizing the cases of Brown versus the Board of Education uh, litigation and legislation was initially inspired by a coalition of attorneys and educators and advocates who, in 2014, came together here in the Greater Boston area in an effort to save what remained of yellow school bus service for Boston public school children. Um, their efforts involved multiple public school transportation hearings held at Boston City Hall. Um, uh, call to order by Ayanna Presley and, and former uh, uh, current Congresswoman Ayanna Presley and former City Councilor Tito Jackson, and um, I, I I was there documenting with film and uh, with video and photography, um, and I was also with my best friend Mia K Evans uh, in the streets trying to let uh, families know that uh, implicated families know that that in just a month or two that they would be losing yellow school bus service, which is a really big deal here because. It is still the case that um, to get to a well-resourced uh, uh, K through 12 uh, public school, um, uh, certain community members have to travel a long distance. And the, the stories that I was hearing in these, in these, um, in these hearings reminded me of, um, you know, stories that we that we hear about the 1930s, 1940s, the pre-Brown versus Board of Education years, and the post Brown versus Board of Education years of the 50s and 60s, children having to travel, you know, many, many miles just to get to school, passing many schools along the way that they're not allowed to go to. Next slide. I love that piece, by the way. This was a pivotal piece. I love that too. And I think that was the first um, piece I saw of you. Um, but yeah, so I realized, uh, I realized by following my friend around as she worked with these advocates that I don't know anything, that I didn't know anything. Um, I was really confused about how there could be these public conversations just openly and nakedly devaluing the lives of a certain subset of children in a city's community. And, um, and I didn't understand that Brown was not just one case. I didn't understand history. Um, I'd come all this way. I've never been to a bad school. None of my public schools or private schools have ever been bad schools, but I had no historical context um, for what was happening in the present. And Nia started reading to me from uh, from paperwork that she had from her year studying education. I realized that I needed to learn about Brown versus the Board of Education. So when I um, uh, they their advocacy inspired me to learn about the Supreme Court case that transformed all of public space as I had known it to that point. Um, and the Boston school transportation hearings also revealed very disturbing similarities uh, of the present um, uh, between the present and the past. And as there were ongoing um, public discourses justifying further defunding public education and almost monthly at that point nationwide uh, events of extremely violent interactions between armed police and vigilantes uh, with black and brown children and young people. Um, so I turned to the documentary photography, um, next slide, to the documentary photography that was used by uh, uh, NAACP legal and educational defense fund attorneys as sociological support for their arguments, I went to those photographs as source material and I started using printmaking to transform them into materials that could be interwoven in my painting space. So I translated these images using painting and printmaking and video, um, sculpture, and also at this point I was knitting fiberworks and immersing them in the same space, placing them all in collision with images from the present day. Next slide. That was a good piece. Actually, go back. Um, there are a few of these pieces that were like significantly transformative. And I remember this one being especially difficult. Um, I didn't know what was- I, at the this, making I, or in the installation? The making, the installation was fine. At that point, everything made sense, but the actually, actually making it was like getting it to come 
um, getting it to come to fruition was not, I didn't know what was supposed to happen. And I remember, I remember finishing, uh, I finished reading Parable of the Talents by Octavia E. Butler. My studio was in New York City uh, with some friends and I uh, was working around the clock. And I remember um, taking a break from trying to like force this painting to be, to be something and uh, laying back on my futon on the floor and finishing this text and, and sleeping. And when I woke up, I looked around and reconsidered my space. I reconsidered that perhaps everything that I needed to finish this piece was already in the room with me. And then it came and then everything made sense. Um, so there's like a constant thing that was hap that's happening with me trying to activate, um, activate the right triangle somehow. And um, yeah, some, somehow, yeah, I looked around and realized that that's what needed to happen, that I needed to pierce the painting uh, with wood and with fiber. The images that are fluttering um, that are fluttering on uh, on on mylar on, on clear mylar, they're images of two segregated classrooms. So this was also at this point I've graduated from Yale and I've, I've retaken color color theory with the Noka Faruqi, and so I was constantly going back to Joseph Albers um, color study color problems to um, help me know what to do with color in. In, a, in the geometrical space that I was trying to trying to bring bring into the world, so I, I took two images from two segregated classrooms, two slightly different reds. They're actually two very different reds. Technically, this is a failure of a color study, but um, uh, the the exercise would be um, make two colors look like one. Limited value exercise. This is a limited value exercise. So um, I really believe in the power of puns and um, metaphor. <laughs> So, you know, this issue of like, uh, um, like understanding the value of a color, um, this, this, these exercises, these attempts to make two colors look like one or one color look like two. And then ultimately the, the, um, the optical illusions that occur when certain colors intersect, the fact that a color is only what we think it is based on what is nearest its edge. All those things I found fascinating as I was sitting in the law library at Yale reading uh, court transcripts. I think it's um, interesting it's like, that you took that, that color theory of Joseph Albers and translated it into sort of current day, you know, um, social norms and the way we look at color, or understand or perceive color. And well, I just saw the language. I just saw the language in the, um, Anoka was literally, uh, next slide. Anoka was literally taking us uh, line by line through, um, through, interaction of color. And I hadn't been inside of that text since undergrad um, at Cooper Union. Um, and I grew up in Los Angeles understanding painting through muralism. And I dropped out of art school, dropped out of SFAI so that I could paint, I could be a muralist assistant, primarily to Juan Alicia, um, who's uh, like an, an epic mural, California muralist. And so we studied, I studied her and she studied John Biggers and uh, Diego Rivera, Siqueiro Sinorosco. And um, so like the purpose of color was mood and the purpose of color was to attract and to like, and the, and the way that public art happened was through engagement in public space. So by the time I, but when I went to Cooper Union, I, I was, when I got to New York, I was thinking, thinking about like how else public space could be engaged without using the side of someone else's wall. Um, so I started asking those questions and, and uh, slowly but surely I arrived at this place where I consider public space to be the public domain. I consider public space to be these historic narratives and patterns of history, positive, negative, difficult, joyous. These, these uh, histories, this connective tissue that many of us, many of us may not even feel operating being the, the the this shared history is our public space um so um yeah i was making these video collages at this time i was starting to realize that um that video was this surprise actor this like recurring experimental video was this recurring surprise actor um to help me like resolve image space so in this i'm in i'm in texas i was doing field research on the first successful case of school desegregation that took place in houston texas in 1949, Heyman Marion Sweat versus Theophilus Painter. The case was argued by Thurgood Marshall, um, and it was one of the was one of the footholds that led to the complex 
the complex strategy for Brown versus the Board of Education. So um, yeah, I use I use photographs that are archival and that are current, um, and I and I, I attempt to place them in collision with each other. Um, in this image, there's I'm in I'm in a, a, a row house at Project Row Houses, hmm. and the image on top. Those are my hands placing an image of uh, Officer Eric Casebolt as he brutally assaults a 14-year-old girl, obviously unarmed, in a bikini at a pool party in McKinney, Texas. Um, beneath, above him is a picture of uh, Heyman Marion Sweat, um, who was a he was a Texan, he was a mail carrier, and he wanted to go to law school. And the letter that he received from UT Austin. Um, law school telling him that his application was stellar except for the fact that he was Negro was all that Thurgood Marshall needed to run with that case and argue that it was unconstitutional to rationalize that he shouldn't be accepted because of that. Beneath the picture of Eric Casebolt assaulting that child is Sandra Bland alive on the right and being assaulted by another officer. Oh sorry, is this me? Am I moving things around? Okay, no, someone can't see something. People need to understand you're talking about the photographs um, in this picture. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, so there, there are photographs within photographs. There's a, yeah. there's a photographs within this photograph. So I'm just yeah. letting you know who's in the, who's in the picture. Many layers of Tomashi Jackson, so. Well, yeah. it's not, well, I mean, it's a still. So this is an image still from one of my video collages. So at the time I'm trying to, I'm trying to create an, a, um, a lexicon for myself, a visual ecosystem. So painting, sculpture, printmaking, um, uh, photography keeps showing up as important, which my former printmaking professor, Lorenzo Clayton, he told me years ago that photography would be important to me and I really didn't believe him. But um, so anyways, there's this picture of Sandra Bland on the right. Um, and then there's a picture of her being assaulted by Brian Insinia, the officer who brutalized her. Um, and she was found dead in a cell. Uh, I think two days later, I was in Texas at that time. I had just arrived there in Houston. Uh, this all happened in front of Prairie View, near Prairie View University, her alma mater, where she'd returned to, to, to start teaching. Um, and then finally, this, the image of the little girl beneath her, um, speaker's window covers up the right. Um, maybe that's a tech issue, a tech person. Victor, I don't, I don't know what to say about that, guys. Um, so the image beneath her, though, is Dejeria Becton. That's the, that's the little girl who was, uh, who was brutalized by Eric Casebolt. So yeah, you know, I'm just constantly experimenting with color and with narrative, with the present and the past, and trying to understand uh, how color perception influences the value of human life in public space. I found it fascinating at this time in Texas that I didn't feel safe outside um, while I was there doing this research. I felt like um, if I stayed outside too long, if I wasn't in my host's home, or if I wasn't at Project Row Houses, that something like what happened to Sandra Bland or to Jerry Beckton could surely happen to me. Okay, we should go to the next slide. Um, yeah, so the work evolved. I was starting to understand that the networks that I had been making for to calm my anxious nerves um, were actually paintings. Hey, Ariel Jackson, could actually be paintings. Um, and I started, I started considering ways of like making the work as fragile as it may seem, making the surface material into something that can hold something else. I wanted it to hold something else. So over here in the in the bottom left behind Alteron's Gumby, there's it's Alteron's who's wearing my color study. And then behind him, there are slivers of images from the NAACP archive of, photo, of photographs of segregated classrooms that are printed in bright colors because I found that when I showed these images in their original black and white form they would often quickly be dismissed as something from a narrative from a far gone time, like a, a long time ago, you know, like a deep past. Um, and the point that I think I, I was trying to make, what I was trying, the point I was trying to make and what I was trying to understand is um, that this is very present. <laughs> you know, what I saw in Boston was this is very present, you know, very, very present. So I, 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 I resolved to only reproduce these images in colors that were as bright as the palettes that I saw in children's uh, sections of clothing stores. Um, so yeah, uh, next slide. I was painting on gauze also, on medical gauze. Um, and then uh, 
and then I was, and then I took the figure out completely. So the figure had reemerged as significant after after years. Mm. I go back and forth. I love portraiture. My nature is portraiture, but I'm always, for a long time, I was very angsty about my reliance on the figure as the reason why I made an image always. Because I felt like I really didn't know what else to do sometimes if I didn't have a, a narrative, a, a figurative narrative to, to draw upon to justify my actions. So the figure had reemerged as significant when I wrapped the color study around Alterance and sat him in front of that painting. Um, and uh, the late Robert Reed told me I really needed to push that. So I appreciated that because he's a, he was a master of color. At this point, I had, uh, when I got to making these video collages, I I'd removed the human figure and started stuffing the fiber works with, um, with uh, these, uh, you know, with the sheets of paper, slivers of paper that were again printed with these images from the NAACP uh, uh, photo, uh, photograph archive. Um, I was studying with Sarah Oppenheimer, which was a really amazing experience. She taught a class called Screen Space. And I was starting to appreciate the movement of shadows through the work and how, um, just how, how light transformed, well, everything. Um, and I'd started again, making something that I didn't recognize and it was exhilarating. Um, so, I'd, so I would make these things and then I would go into another editing process and pull out specific colors and drop in images, um, well, images of significance uh, taken from the public domain. And in this case, what's pretty illegible here because it's a still, were pictures of my cousins playing in Los Angeles, little children. So I was merging the bodies and the, 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 the playful spirits of the little children in my family with the images of these little children from 1953 when the um, photographs were taken. And you know, oftentimes a lot of it is illegible. Like it really requires, it really requires like meditative time. Cause I, the question I was asking Corinne was how can I make this video function like a painting? That's the question I was asking. I wanted the video to function as a painting. In this case, I wanted the video to function as a sculpture. Um, okay, I think many of your videos actually are a real extension of your of your painting. They're very poetic, very lyrical, and again, you know, all these layers come together. And uh, what I also want to say is, it's amazing how you bring sort of the abstract, historical, together with very personal lived experiences. And and I think that just shows in your in your work. And, and I think that's why it, it, it touches us. But we should. I should stop. We should go on. <laughs> the the next on. slide. Um, yeah, that was that, those two pieces were made when I was studying experimental sculpture with, uh, with Michael Queenland, uh, which was amazing. It really just changed everything. You know, he had us thinking about vehicle to get into his class. People wanted to be in his class so bad that we had to answer a question <laughs> to get into that class. And he gave us a prompt and we had to come back with a proposal. And that had me thinking for the rest of the year about vehicle. And I thought to myself, can color function as a vehicle for complex narrative? Can complex narrative then function as a vehicle for, emo for emotion? Can emotion function as a vehicle for sound? And then can sound in turn close that loop functioning as a vehicle for color? Um, so that really influenced things a lot. Uh, so the next body of work is based on um, Atlanta transportation and um, voting rights my first uh, institutional solo show called Interstate Love Song, which was a nod to the Stone Temple Pilots. Um, music shows up over and over again is significant in the reasons why I do things. Um, let's go to the next slide. Um, this was a really uh, pivotal piece. I continue to think about this, Corinne, after the last time we spoke earlier today. Um, so I had been given a stack of, uh, of voting materials from a brilliant, um, professor from Alabama or from who a professor from Georgia who was working in Alabama uh, directing the art gallery at Tuskegee University professor John Teal Robinson and while I was there doing one of my site visits I got to see her again we'd met we'd met in New Haven before and I got to see her again and she happened to be collecting all of these voting materials because um, that year Karen Handel the Republican was running against John Ossoff a Democrat and protege of Representative John Lewis in um, Cobb County, Georgia. Um, the county that helped give birth to the county unit voting system, um, to the uh, 
the rule of the rustics, um, the practice of, of valuing votes from less populated rural areas um, uh, uh, instead of valuing the more populated city centers for their votes. So, um, so this was a historic, uh, this was an historic uh, race. It was at the time the most expensive congressional race in American history and voters were inundated with materiality. Um, and this was the first time, bef uh, the first time that she had collected all this stuff. And we met at Tuskegee University and she brought with her this big old bag of voting materials. And I didn't know how I was gonna use them. I just thought that they were um, fascinating and significant as, as objects that reflected the time. And I was learning from people there, um, talking to people during the studio, during these visits, because it's, it, should, it should be noted that I was, I'm not from there. You know, my, the, the, the work about school desegregation that took me to Texas was very personal because I was born there. Um, and I was trying to see myself inside of this larger, his, I was starting finally to see myself as a part of a larger history, um, an educational history that I really, I didn't, I didn't realize that I was a little girl that so many people put so much energy into like preventing from having education. Um, uh, but this work in Georgia, I'm not from there. I had never been there. So I had to go there and figure out what the work was supposed to be. I did not know going into it. And I met wonderful people. Um, I went to parties. So Tomas, um, what prompts you to, to pick a certain topic or a certain area um, or place, um, you know, for well, in this really digging into that research? Because it is, it is a very thorough research that you usually do to create your work. Well, I was invited. So I was invited to come there and do a show. Uh, the, the people of, the, of that institution, you know, expressed an interest in how my work was showing up so far, but I didn't know, I didn't go in there presuming that I knew what, to, that what the work was gonna be about or, or that I was gonna be making some sort of a statement. I just, I, I went and, and was quiet. I sat in passenger seats as, and drove around with people and made observations. People took me places. I spent some time at the Clark Atlanta University um, uh, uh, art museum, you know, I was just, I, I, I looked for signs and, um, and people were very generous with me. And every time I had a conversation with people, like one, basically like one clue led to another. Let's go to the next slide. I just want to say that this, this piece, this last piece before we go, it was pivotal because, um, it like, like states rights, it was difficult to make because I didn't, I was, it was, it was an uneasy experience. But I started placing the um, voting materials on the wall in this in, in my bedroom here because I was teaching at the same time too, so I couldn't be in New York at my studio. And then I had to figure out once I found a geometry that I found satisfying for whatever reason, I then had to figure out how it was going to hold itself together. Yeah, right. Um, I totally. But I wasn't thinking about a circuit board. I wasn't thinking about. I was only trying to figure out what felt right and not to be like. It's not a nihilistic pursuit. Like I was really trying to figure out what this piece was supposed to be and not force it because of my nervousness about deadlines and stuff, not force it to be something else. And what it ended up evolving into is this thing that has changed everything else that's come after it. Um, embedded in the shape. So I'm, this weird shape gets made because of the voting materials. And then I start using paper bags and laminating them into the surface so that I can make my own surface. Right. Which so has always been handles of the paper bags that we see. And that's always been important to me yeah. to like make something that otherwise does not exist in the world. So um, so that was a clue for me that this was the right direction. And then um, and then I had uh, I brought back with me um, from from Georgia uh, red clay. Um, the curator sent them to me. Uh, Sarah sent them to me. Uh, containers full of uh, red clay that I pulled out of the ground next door to her home. Um, after uh, what had been a, a very important community center in a black neighborhood had been demolished to be replaced by condos. There was this moment when it, there was just a red hole in the ground and I crawled in there and pulled out soil and brought it back here with me. So it became important to me to figure out the conundrum of a shape, to try to understand the shape of a thing, and then to affirm its shape by so marking its path. Yeah, okay. All right, All right. next slide. Um, and this was a really important step. Um, I had fantasies since moving to New York to, um, to make an awning. Uh, to, um, so public space again, I'm always wondering about like 
the nature of public space and what defines public space in a place. And um, again, I'm from California and uh, with, with time spent in Northern California and my uh, developmental, what is it? My, what is it? The special years, my formative years in Los Angeles. Um, so I noticed things like the prevalence of storefront awnings and um, fire escapes when I got to New York. And, you know, so I was always asking like, what makes a painting a painting? What makes a sculpture a sculpture? What makes a print a print? Um, what makes a photograph a photograph? Um, and at the time I was thinking, I was learning that um, a painting is generally bound to a wall. Um, and then a sculpture is something that affirms and a, that asserts itself in space. And what I learned from Nikki Logis back in those days was that like a sculpture could take care of itself. A sculpture was self-sufficient. So um, there, I became fascinated with the awning as this object that, that nods, that like speaks of a public function, but also relies upon um, something that's built. It relies upon, it, it has a function in the built environment to provide shelter for a body. Um, and it's supposed to be outside. And it's really it, beautiful the way the reflection works with the photos, um, with the light so that you see actually photographs as if there were photographs on the wall. And it's almost as if these people are actually protected by by this awning. Well, yeah, I don't, yeah. Well, I guess, yeah. I mean, it's supposed to be. So it's it's it relies on the wall to exist. Like the structure relies on yeah. on on a on a on an architectural structure to exist. It comes out. It it can perform a function, a protective function. Um, but uh, but it's a painting. That's what I was saying. So it's a painting. It's a it's a frame that's wrapped up in canvas. So my logic, every time I went into, um, hey, what happened? Um, every time, oh, did we lose our host? Um, somehow, I think we did. Um, well, I, let me see what's happening in the chat while we figure out what happens, what happens. Hi, everyone. Anna Rosen is here. Oh, this is amazing. I think we did, we did lose okay, our host. Oh, right. Thank you. So, so yeah, so my, my thinking was like, wow, there's a painting happening. There's a painting happening without the figure. Um, there, there's a painting happening. Um, hey, Ali, there's a, uh, Molly's here. This is amazing. Um, Elka from Watermill. So yeah, let me focus. So there's a painting happening every time I see an awning. And then I became really obsessed with what would happen if I brought an awning indoors. Um, because I was like really, really angsty about, about distinctions between public and private space and uh, collapsing them and, and uh, like, uh, what is it, puncturing those distinctions. So in this, right. in this piece, I'm using images. Uh, it's another limited value study, uh, limited value uh, exercise, very much inspired by states' rights. Uh, two slightly different reds um, printed on mylar in strips. The images came from the Georgia State University archive. One image is of uh, white suburbanite protesters uh, protesting, uh, demonstrating against the expansion of public transportation. And then the other image is of, uh, oh, and that image was from 1984, I think. And then the other image I found online from 2014 of um, people of color, mostly black women and other people of color, demonstrating for um, funding and expanding public transportation in Clayton County, where they at that point had lost all of their public transportation. Um, all of it had been defunded. No buses, no trams, no trains. So people who were already economically vulnerable could not move, could not earn money, couldn't go to school. Um, and it, it, it aggravated and compounded existing um, disparities. So what I learned from listening to the stories of people that I met you know, one person led me to another person, led me to another person, and I just listened to people's experiences in Georgia and not listening for anything bad, but just listening to what people told me. And then one thing would lead, one thing would, you know, like be a seed that I would take into another conversation. And what rose to the surface was the fact that transportation, its funding and defunding um, uh, was a, a hotbed of political activity. Um, and that it framed not only who lived where, but also uh, whose votes were counted. 
So transportation funding was deeply tied to, um, to voter disenfranchisement. And it had been for centuries, I came to learn. Uh, when I, I read um, Kevin Cruz's, Kevin M. Cruz wrote White Flight, Atlanta and the Making of Modern Conservatism. He's a, he's a historian uh, at, at uh, Princeton. He lived there for, I think, a couple of years and, and, compi and compiled the research for this book. So I look to other people's stories and other people's research to let me know what I'm supposed to try to visualize through the language of color. Um, next uh, slide. And um, yeah, and so more, more things were happening with uh, these stills of uh, the video collages that I was making. So I'm starting to, at this point, I'm starting to believe more and more in the, in the visual ecosystem and the, in the lexicon that I'm trying to make based on discipline. Like I, I respect disciplines and then I challenge them to push each other or be each other or break each other. So uh, video was turning back into photography, like new images were being made. And I appreciated that, um, that in, in returning the moving image that I made, like turning my paintings and knitwork uh, uh, and, and collaging, like my compiling of material into moving images to, make, to take stills from them and make them photographs, big nod to my photo friends. My photo friends know that like I, I'm geeked about them like e extremely. Because like it brings it brings the moving image back into this tactile realm that exists without the need for technological intermediary to experience them. I'm always wary of video because something can always go wrong. But when that image is 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 still is a still composition, it exists like my paintings exist, like a sculpture exists. So yeah, it's really satisfying. Let's go to the next one. Um, yeah, and that's what the videos look like when they were projected in the space, um, the video collages. Um, that there's an image over there on the left pulled from Kevin Cruz's book. Um, I learned about the white supremacist uh, groups that um, formed uh, and became emboldened after, um, after Brown, well, after after um, uh, after a number of desegregation policies went into place, so they would bomb black people when they moved into the wrong neighborhoods. These these guys were called the Colombians. Um, and over here is a young man named Derek that I met, um, a Morehouse man who studied philosophy, and he was good enough to come out to the Chattahoochee River with me and let me wrap him in my color study. And uh, when I went into the editing process, I pulled out specific colors and dropped in images from more from the Georgia State University archives, this time about um, city maps, about redlining. We should go to the next uh, slide. Thank you, Jackie Black. Okay, um, this last, uh, oh, it's not the last one, um, but I will, yeah, let's just go, let's go. So this was Time Out of Mind, my second show at Tilton Gallery. Um, this body of work was focused, again, on a place that I'm not from, but a place that I love. New York City, um, and uh, this body of work also produced my three contributions to the 2019 Whitney Biennial. Um, so, uh, how about we go like we let let's go like every like eight seconds. Yes, let's like, um, let's just like let's just let's just keep on rolling. Let's this now. forward, and then we come to the the land claim. Yeah. So I, I didn't know what this work, I didn't know that this body of work was gonna be, I don't know any, I don't know anything ahead of time. I know very little ahead of time. But, uh, but I did come across some journalism that blew my mind around this time. Uh, this was a very, a very important piece uh, to me. Um, uh, yeah, I came across journal some journalism in um, uh, Kings County politics, Stephen Witt, and Kelly Mena were two journalists who were working together there. And I start, I, I came across one of their pieces about um, the third party transfer program and the, um, oh, I love that piece. Um, they were writing about how contemporary black and brown neighborhoods, property owners fully paid for properties were being seized by the city and handed over to third party not-for-profits who were shells for developers that were actively gentrifying neighborhoods and clearing them out, and that this was only happening to black and brown property owners. I couldn't believe it. This was, uh, what, this is like 2018 when I started seeing these articles? So I started following these, uh, these journalists and their headlines show up in the buttons that I had made, that we had made for these pieces. 
Um, um, Shubasa Berg was the photographer that worked with them. Can we pause on this one? So Shubasa took this photograph of McConnell Dorsey on the right. And I found this photograph of, um, oh my gosh. Oh, uh, oh, brain, don't do this to me. Um, Mary Joseph Lyons and Albro Lyons were two black property owners and prominent abolitionists in antebellum New York. They owned property in, Sen in what was Seneca Village, which was a, a black enclave on the west side of what's now Central Park. So when I started reading that journalism, I was like, huh, this sounds a lot like Seneca Village <laughs> or, and what little I know. So um, I started spending time at the Cooper Union Library and uh, it was really hard to find images. There are no images of Seneca Village. There are no photographs and it's not that photography didn't exist at the time. But so I found these images of two people who owned property in Seneca Village and I started merging them with Shubasa's photographs like here for, the, for one of my pieces in the biennial. Um, Marlene Saunders is merged in a simultaneous contrast attempt with Mary Joseph Lyons. Um, and they're, sim they're in simultaneous contrast. It's not an attempt to make two colors look like one because Marlene got her property back. Mary Joseph Lyons didn't. And you're still using the paper bags and uh, and the new ele another element that you're introducing there is the button. Can you briefly talk about that? Yeah, I, what I love about the paper bag, the evolution of the paper bag handles. So at this point, I'm not relying on the paper bag to be the entirety of the surface. This is a really nice piece of linen. Um, but the, the, the paper bags are functioning like they did and still remains. Um, they are allowing me to pull this flat surface taut against the wall, like it's stretched on the wall. Um, so it's evolving at this point. It, things really come to a head with this last body of work, um, Forever My Lady, that took place at Night Gallery um, with Anna Rosen. And um, yeah, but this was, this is, we're, we're on our way. Um, so yeah, what else is, and the buttons. The buttons, why did I start using buttons? I think, you know, it was once again, when I was working on that, that last big piece, can we go back, Victor, just one? I know I said I just wanted to power through, but this piece, um was a conundrum and uh this piece is called a uh, hometown buffet in two blues um mr ronald calendar's building uh seneca villagers limited value exercise and still thinking of rainisha i often think of rainisha mcbride and i often think of rakia boyd uh two young black girls who were um killed so I mean, yeah, anyways, the, the subtitles are, are, are significant, but I started using the buttons because I think I had some. I had some in my, in my studio. And the buttons allowed me to pull images from the books that I was looking at at the Cooper Union Library of like Central Park before it was built up. And it also allowed me to highlight, it also, hey, Jeffrey, it also allowed me to highlight um, the, the, the the headlines from uh, Kelly and Stevens journalism. Um, and there, so there are buttons with uh, um, Harriet Tubman and Arturo Schomburg, after whom the Schomburg uh, library is named uh, after, is named for, and um, uh, Thurgood Marshall, who's just like a constant hero of mine and Albro and Mary Joseph Lyons, they're all embedded there. So I guess, I don't know, I'm always thinking about how things like stick together and fit together. Let's we uh, have a question here in the Q&A, which is actually one that I wanted to ask you too, is how, how do you know when a work is finished? Lord, when you... I just know sometimes. This one kept me up at night. Um, okay. uh, this, this one definitely kept me up at night. Do you go back um, sometimes when you think it was finished? Well, I mean, I am, it's increasingly, I can't do that because it doesn't belong to me anymore. Um, but um, yeah, I can feel it. I mean, this is this is why feelings are so important. I mean, Anna knows this because this last show that uh, that happened at Night Gallery, I was like painting outside. Like if there if there's something that I feel is undone, I, I, I keep on trying to figure it out until it's resolved. Um, but let's go on. Um, so yeah, this was this- Your most recent show in Los Angeles. Yeah, and my most personal, um, <laughs> what did Anna say? Even hung it in the gallery space, still painting. Yeah, I was causing a lot of trouble. And I didn't realize it. 
Um, let's go to the next I know, slide. I know what to expect, Tamashi. No, no, no. <laughs> Anna, stop. We're telling, we're giving ourselves away. Um, yeah, so this, 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 I love this body of work. So this, this work began, this piece began in Athens, Greece. But there's another piece in this in this set that began um, at Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture. Um, after the Whitney, uh, <clears throat> I went off to the woods with an incredible group of people and ran ran headlong into uh, a wall, like an artistic wall, um, right into existential crisis. And um, you know, things that I considered were like, maybe I shouldn't make this work anymore because every time I dig further into history, I find more that makes me sad. And, you know, how can I not be sad all the time? Um, hey, Anton, this is bomb. Um, yeah, so I didn't want to be sad all the time. Um, so I was thinking about that. And, and at Skowhegan, we talked a lot about ghosts and um, some, some people said that they were afraid of ghosts. I wasn't really worried about ghosts, but, but sometimes when I'd be walking by myself, one night I remember walking by myself in the woods and thinking like, if I could see a ghost, who would I want to see? And I thought I would really, other than my grandparents, other than my elders, I'd really like to see Gary Webb. Gary Webb was the journalist who broke the story about uh, the US government's complicit um, role in um, accelerating and facilitating what became the cocaine explosion of the 80s that all but destroyed my, the fabric of my family in Los Angeles. And then not just my family, but um, yeah, Anton, I'm accidentally answering your question. So not just my family, but we watched our whole community um, be eaten alive from the inside. And as a child, I didn't really understand what I was seeing. And you know, a people who are traumatized, communities who are traumatized don't always have it takes a while to develop the language to even understand what's happening in the middle of in the middle of a crisis, and we were in an undeclared public health crisis, uh, and the answer to our public health crisis was the acceleration of private prisons and three strikes, and it was not it was not um, it was not compassionate and it was not therapeutic, so it's taken me a lot of years to try to like understand even what happened. And Gary Webb uh, broke the story and lost his entire career because of what he revealed. And a lot of, a lot of people were very invested in um, discrediting him, everything that, he, everything that he wrote about in his uh, series for the San Jose Mercury News, Dark Alliance has been proven to have been true years later. So when I think about Los Angeles, I knew that I was preparing for the show in Night Gallery. I knew that Night Gallery is in LA. I was not gonna be able to make an authentic and sincere body of work without reflecting on what that mean, what origin means to me. That is where my life really began um, after, after Texas. So then from, from Skowhegan, um, I just didn't know what I was, I didn't know how it was supposed to work out, but I started making surfaces. And then I went to VCU. I don't have images from that work, but the work that happened at VCU, making these monuments of color um, curated by Amber Aceva um, at the uh, ICA at VCU for an amazing show called Great Force. I uh, worked with two amazing assistants to draw, uh, Carolyn and Alex, to draw uh, projections of half tone line images onto the glass facade of this building in oil stick. The use of oil stick is totally inspired by Joan Jonas. But um, that showed me that I could blow a photographic image up larger than I ever could relying on printmaking alone. It changed everything. So after that, I went to Greece. I went to Athens, Greece. And there I was in the bed and, you know, in the, in the seat of what we are told is the founding place of the democracy that ours is supposed to mimic, um, right down to the facades of the uh, Acropolis. And, um, you know, I was really like, you know, thinking about like, wow, this is what I was walking through the ancient Agora with, a, with an archeologist learning. Let's go to the next slide. Yeah, that's learning, really um, learning about the fact that, um, learning about the fact that real democracy, Athenian democracy was predicated on the obligatory participation of everyone. Um, everyone was supposed to vote. And so I'm listening to this and I'm like, we've never had democracy in the United States. Every time, every time, uh, every time, uh, well, my people historically um, attempt to access these keys of citizenship, we are met uh, with uh, terrorism and suppression. Um, here's an image, 
Um, here is an image um, uh, from my mother. My mother took this picture of me, my sister, and my aunt. And uh, it's printed on vinyl um, in collision with an image of, from Eugene Edwards's Cocaine True, Cocaine Blue that was blown up that, uh, that Anna and I painted in the studio. Um, so this is, uh, you know, obviously, you know, again, more, more practical color theory, color theory um, uh, functions happening here, simultaneous contrast. Thank you, Na. Um, simultaneous contrast happening as red intersects with blue. Um, it's painted on top of uh, materials that I brought, brought back from Greece um, and embedded in the surface. Let's go to the next, uh, to the next um, slide. Embedded in all of these surfaces, uh, was marble dust brought back from the quarry on Mount Pentelli that is that since the 1800s and ever since well ever since the 1800s it opened in the 1800s. This is the quarry that supplies the marble for all of the restorations of the sacred temples in Athens. Um, so literally, uh, I jokingly refer to it as democracy dust. Um, and while at Skowhegan, you know, we were re-learning re um, uh, uh, with an amazing painter, uh, well, just amazing people there, period, but we, a bunch of us were re-learning um, uh, painting, classical painting surface preparation, you know, marble dust, whiting, animal skin glue, um, and we were also painting frescoes with Oscar Cornejo. Um, I found that painting into this marble dust in a way that, like, it's returning to returning to something that I walked away from when I was 16, which was the traditional use of the canvas. I was so angsty. I would like throw my canvases in the street and drive over them. Like I really like was insistent that if it already existed, then I wasn't needed. I so, think it's really amazing how you combine these, you know, sacred materials with sort of everyday material and create something amazingly beautiful. Yeah, um, let's keep going to the next one. Um, the structures themselves are really important. They were, um, uh, they, they were building off of, 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 of a piece of, you know, like I, I was still thinking about awnings and thinking about how if I make them more shallow, that changes them. And then I met an amazing man um, named Ruben Palencia, an amazing uh, thinker and artist and craftsman whose studio was in the same temp it was in the space where I was temporarily studioing and he made these frames. Let's keep going. This is the one that started at uh, Skowhegan that really gave me the blues. Um, these are my sisters. This is called Girls' Time Heartbreak Hotel. That's my little sister and my big sister in downtown Los Angeles. I don't know, circa 1991, maybe 1992. Um, yeah, so I take these, you know, these. So I think I was thinking about, um, you know, contradictions of uh, origin and contradictions, um, and the perversion of democracy. This, at what what is for us uh, the experience of perverted democracy and just how it changes everything. I was also noting, let's keep going to the next slide, also noting that for us, democracy begins in 1965 with the signing of the Voting Rights Act. So the images were only were taken from uh, the LBJ library um, signing, and in his signing of the Voting Rights Act. Those images were collapsed. Actually, I know we're running out of time. Um, we're like out of time. Um, we're gonna those, go a little over, but let's keep it moving so we can get okay. to to Radcliffe and, and right on yeah. um yeah so so I took images from from domestic terrorism um uh Victor I know this is going to be ridiculous as we acknowledge that we're going over but can you go back two slides back to the first slide for this set I'm sorry Corinne you'll please forgive me okay we have time. If we do it quickly can we go back Victor are you with us check one check two is that his refusing okay then I have to keep moving so so I took images of church bombings of the bus bombing, the Ku Klux when the Ku Klux Klan bombed uh, a bus of Freedom Riders that were in the in the Deep South to register people to vote. I take those images and then they're printed on vinyl, um, and then they in a half tone line so that sorry it's a bus so that they become collapsed with uh, with the the image. And this last one was the last thing that I made, a uh, Temple for Bakari, Shady Grove Church bombing. So there's a strip from the uh, with a photograph of the Shady Grove Church bombing. What happened? Um, that is interacting with um, with uh, interacting with an image of a boy named Bakari Henderson, who was killed on the Pleasure Island of Zykynthos in Greece, 
and that the, the uh, there's an image of his um of his uh graduation picture that is in collision with an image of his parents after they found out that his attackers would not be charged with murder um and before he before he was he was chased into the street and 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 beaten to death uh and it was all caught on closed circuit television i remember being horrified um by this event um and when i was in when i was in athens i felt like I felt like, you know, he was also from Texas. I felt like, I felt like I had to acknowledge that he, I had to, I had to acknowledge him. I had a great time in Athens. I was there for the ARC Athens residency. It was a wonderful time, but I'm, it, it never escapes me. These things never escape me. So I knew about his life. I knew about what happened to him. And I knew that I wanted to make a, a piece that was dedicated to him. This piece is distinct from all the other pieces in Forever My Lady, not only because I kept working after the show was hung, but this piece is completely embedded with marble dust, sacred marble dust, you know, like from, from Mount Penteli. Can you quickly um, uh, talk to the title, Forever My Lady? Quickly. Oh yeah, um, my, one of my favorite boy bands growing up was Jodeci. Their debut album was Forever My Lady. So their debut album was the title for my debut show, uh, my first time showing at a real, a real deal gallery in Los Angeles. Um, Technically, my first show in LA was at a record store when I was 21, but um, yeah, so Forever My Lady. It just always comes back to music. And when, uh, when Night Gallery invited me to come to show there, what, like a couple of years ago, the one thing that I knew, I didn't know what the work was gonna be about, but I knew that it was gonna be called Forever My Lady. Let's keep going. Um, yeah, so yeah, more, this is again, Ruben Palencia, Ruben Palencia. We really worked together to design these structures. And um, I, like this, I, I can't even, it's hard to even say how, um, how significantly satisfying. <laughs> like, I feel like I've grown up. I feel like I grew up with this show um, that I'm no longer, like I, I now finally know how I want things to look. Let's keep going. That, um, that, that painting for Bakari, the way that the, the pigment sits inside of that marble dust, um, it just brings everything together. Like it's really an experience to see that piece in, in, in real life. I think it's one of the most beautiful things I've ever made. And um, yeah, and here's a color study again without a figure um, on its own um, in heroic proportion on this plinth that Ruben made. Let's keep going. Yeah, no, no, uh, you're not kidding, Jackie. Still happening in Georgia, still happening everywhere. Um, and this, this piece is called uh, Ecology of Fear, which is a text that was written about Los Angeles by an amazing historian named Mike Davis, Gillum for governor of Florida. One of my former professors uh, who um, moved to Florida. Uh, so after, after Still Remains, I started asking people to collect and send me voting materials from around the country during the midterm elections. I felt like I'd done Still Remains, um, I'd done that piece of disservice by covering so much of it up with gesso. The really the only way to see the, the political messaging is to look at its back. Um, so I started asking people to send me more, um, more stuff. And the biggest package, next slide, the biggest package came from Professor uh, Erica James with this huge Andrew Gillum for governor sign. So I dragged it with, to Maine with me to try to resolve it, cut, started cutting it up and then brought what was left of it to Los Angeles and this is this was the resolution. So this is what I'm talking about. So here's here's LBJ signing the Voting Rights Act in 1965, which again, if we're looking at the history of Athenian democracy as an example, this actually would mark a real beginning of democracy in the United States, 1965, and it is in collision with another blue that tells the story of the Ku Klux Klan bombing a bus load full of voter uh, uh, kids who were out to register pe black people in, in the rural South to vote. Um, Anna Rosen helped me paint this picture. And then the, the canvas, all of the canvas was made in Greece, all of it. And um, yeah, and it's embedded with voting papers from a recent election in Athens that was really significant because that last election in Athens saw the, uh, the, the finally the overtaking of the golden dawn um, and them, them, be, them getting pushed out of parliament. That was a really big deal. So um, yeah, that's that. Let's move on. Y'all, thanks for bearing with me. I'm sorry that this is, uh, that, that, you know, we should have, I should, Corinne told me to use fewer slides. It's my fault. Let's keep going. 
All right, that, it's such great work. But um, anyway, so we're moving towards an exhibition you were planning for Radcliffe. And yes, uh, yes. The, so the, COVID the virus happened. happened, the show couldn't happen, but it, you pivoted into a whole research um, project, which uh, is yielding an amazing body of work. So if you it could just really is talk about that and then we move to. Yeah, the yeah. Well, so all of this, I, I just wanted to, you know, I'm so excited. I've been excited to be, um, you know, welcomed by the parish um, to come down and to, to, well, to come down, it depends on where one is, I suppose. Come out. But um, yeah, to come, to come out, um, I've been visiting uh, Long Island um, for, for a couple of years and just wherever I move through space, I'm wondering what is going on with people. <laughs> what's going on that I can't see? And that's like, what's, um, like, what are the patterns? Like, what are the, the question is always like, what is the echo through history that's rumbling under this ground that can't be seen outwardly? What's been left out of the history books? What's not being talked about? Exactly. What's happening. And are so- you, Are you ready to move to the next slide or do you want no. to stay here? No, 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 no. I'm, I'm mentioning this because this is important. It, this is important because of what, what's, what's happening now with the parish project. COVID happened um, in the middle of my project with the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. This, the body of work that's been happening here was supposed to bring me back into my research about school desegregation, which I felt was truly incomplete. And um, so the, the focus of the work has been Brown to the case that happened in 1955 that focused on actual implementation of desegregation policies in this, in this country. And just as I was about to send out my invitation to um, a, a, a number of people to be discussants for symposia, the campus was evacuated. You know, we started going into lockdown and I get to work. Thank you, Stephanie. I swear to God, we're almost there. Um, uh, I get to work, um, uh, at VCU, I got to have two mural assistants for the first time, Alex and Carolyn. At, at, um, at, at, with Night Gallery, I got to work with a, 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 a painter helping me paint for the first time, Anna Rosen. And at, and at Harvard, I got my first set of research assistants, which was amazing. And we were having these in-person meetings trying to figure out what the archival research was going to look like so that I could make a new set of works on paper about about um, uh, DSEG in, in, uh, implementation. And then, um, and then everything got weird. So we met and decided as a group uh, to continue. K. Anthony Jones, Martha Schnee, uh, Kayla Jackson, Fatima Sek. Uh, uh, we decided that we wanted to pivot, that we wanted to continue the work somehow and that we could use recorded videos of our interviews with the people that we had wanted to have symposia with to produce a whole, what I like to call the flowering bush of archival expanded, of expanded archival material for a narrative that most of us don't know enough about on a good day. When things are regular, this isn't being taught. So we ended up with this, we've ended up with this archive of Martha's drawings and notes from our conversations. We have uh, a wealth of, um, of interview preparation documents like the ones seen here that anchor our conversations with people like Matthew Kreger and David Harris, who's the executive, who's the director of the Charles Hamilton Houston Center for Race and, Center for Race and Justice at Harvard Law. Um, it's just been incredible. So like we've only now, we've continued to work all throughout quarantine and we've now arrived at copy edited uh, excerpts of these in some cases, three hour interviews with some of the most amazing advocates and historians. Um, uh, Meredith Whitaker of AI Now Institute, Rashida Richardson, who's policy director at uh, policy research director at AI Now Institute, Nia K. Evans of the Boston Ujima Project, Matthew Kreger, um, David Harris, Donna Bivens, and the Dean of Radcliffe Institute, uh, uh, Dean Tamiko Brown Nagan, who's an incredible historian and attorney in her own right. Um, so we have had this like crazy feeling of goodness during some incredibly challenging, like pain, like, you know, during mournful times. One of our goals was to, was to shift the project so that it could be a radical service at this time, um, so that we could create access to it, so that we could be sensitive to the fact that people are overwhelmed, you know, image overwhelmed. I'm, I'm screen fatigued, you know? So like, how do we make the work accessible for people who don't want to look at anything else? How do we make the work accessible so that no one's made to feel stupid for not knowing this already? Um, how, do we, how do we make it inviting and enticing to expand and rethink the, this image of, 
of, of uh, this image that so many, so many of us already think we know what this looks like. What we've uncovered through digging through the Radcliffe archives, specifically focusing on the lives of Ruth Batson and Pauli Murray, is a whole nother way to, to, to visualize this, this like multi-generational strategic effort to affirm and support and protect human rights. At the end, we ended, we ended up, we end this whole project with a conversation, we end the publication that's also meant to serve as a site for curricular reference. We end with this amazing conversation with technologists and human rights specialist, uh, Sabelo Umlambi, who was from Southern Africa, who tells us about Ubuntu and how it's distinct from Western philosophies focus on the individual as a, a rationality versus relationality that the only way we can move forward is to acknowledge that we are all connected. At the heart of all of this is the question of who gets to be human, who gets to be considered human. Um, so I this is a fundamental question. And so um, this has changed um, everything. So, so this lets me know that it's possible that even as things remain uncertain, that moving forward with the land claim project is possible. Like I'm really excited to, to employ this methodology that's evolved right in front of us. Next slide that's involved in front of us into, um, into this work returning to, um, to Long Island. Um, during my visit there in late January, early February, again, right before things got weird, next slide, um, uh, Corinne took me around to meet incredible people. <laughs> so these are people who work um, in organizations that are partners to the parish and that do amazing works in, in uh, various communities of color. And um, I think exactly when we started that conversation, you asked me what's going on in the Hamptons, you know, yeah. knowing your work and, and um, how you've been focusing on infrastructural racism, as I would call it, you know, such as education, transportation, housing, and so forth. And I'm like, yeah, this is kind of the problem what we're seeing in the Hamptons, uh, the, the issue of public space and access and, um, you know, three distinct communities or let's say, you know, groups from the Shinnecock Nation, obviously they've been there for, you know, as long as, as history. And uh, they're right in Southampton, but I don't think many people in the Hamptons do know about, about the Shinnecock. Um, histories of um, black migration from the South, but also slavery on the East End, uh, for example, on Shelter Island, and uh, more recent um, histories of uh, various uh, Latin American communities who have been really terribly intimidated by ICE coming in and targeting people, especially on the road. So again, the issue of transportation, the fear uh, when uh, moving around and all of that kind of came back to all the work that you have been doing. And so um, you came out in January just before, you know, kind of the whole virus hit and you met with um, several people. Uh, we can go through these uh, images. On the left is uh, Georgette Briarkey from the Eastville Historical Society. Um, on the right, we have um, Minerva Perez from Olaf Eastern Island, who works with um, various um, Latin communities. And uh, if we go to the next slide, we have uh, Juni! Richard Juni Wingfield, um, who is a liaison for the Southampton School. Um, System and on the right, Bonnie Cannon, who um, is from the Bridgehampton Childcare and uh, Recreation Center. Um, so it we were incredibly fortunate that you were able to meet with um, all these amazing, um, you know, community leaders and historians. And I know you took copious um, notes, yeah, which is all informing the work that you're going to do for the land claim. Yeah, and, and it's just the, and it's just the, the beginning. Project is is a sample of what's going to happen before we can actually show the, the, the works. Yeah, and what, so what I've seen with my amazing RAs uh, um, through the Harvard Radcliffe project is that the work can continue. Um, so like, I'm really excited to, um, I'm really excited to, uh, what is it? I like, I like thinking about, maybe someone in the room knows, some, knows this better than I do, but to become a law, a scientific law, something has to be tried three times, what there's theory, hypothesis, and then experimentation. So anyways, like I have full faith in the methodology that's arisen out of this crisis and our pivoting. When I look at the materials that we've collected from the interviews, I literally shudder to think how easily we could have just stopped working and just waited for postponement or, you know? It was um, such a so blessing. I mean, it was amazing that we had that time and it's almost a blessing in disguise 
with um, this sort of um, reflective time that we all have to go through where you're actually able to expand that research and create these uh, amazing um, you know, components for the, for the project. And so I think the exhibition that's gonna hopefully happen next summer at the parish, and hopefully you will be able to do the residency at the Watermill Center who had kindly invited you to be the Ingemar. Yeah, yeah. Year. Can we, can we go back one picture? The spring so that you can actually do the work. Um, but um, yeah, I just wanted to acknowledge, um, so what was supposed to happen and what hopefully still will happen is that I was going to get to, I was going to finish the Radcliffe project and then go to Long Island and uh, be an artist in residence at uh, the Watermill Center with these beautiful people on the left with Kelly and Elka and Micah, who's not pictured. And um, it was the conversation with Kelly really, really brought everything home and made me very excited to to be able to you know, to, to have a home there at Watermill to make this work um, that would be shown at the parish. But in, my com in our conversation with Kelly, she's the one who, she's, she's, a, she's of the Shinnecock Nation. And she's, right. she told me, number one, that there's a film that all of us need to see uh, called Conscience Point um, about the Shinnecock people and the, the ongoing fight, the ongoing battle over uh, the land and who gets to be considered human and, and valued um, in that land. Um, it's a film that, um, let me see, let me see, hold on a second. Um, yeah, it was, it was the conversation with Kelly that let me know that the show should be called The Land Claim. Much like I knew that Forever My Lady was the title. You know, I just, I look for signs um, and the conversation with Kelly was like very, very pivotal. So um, we've actually already started having conversation, but I'm excited to to properly enter even remotely, um, you know, taking guidance from, from community members there, uh, who to speak to and, and, and what, what my, well, first I have to get my team together, right? So something that I've learned is that, well, I can't do it all myself. Um, it's never actually just one person who makes anything happen. So um, I'm really excited about uh, the Parish Museum continuing to be agile um, and helping me to do this work the best way I possibly can um, with the utmost and, um, respect and care. We'll keep connecting you. And uh, I just want to say in um, sort of trying to conclude here that we are going to have more of these Friday night talks with Tomashi and with um, many of these people that have been helpful in the research that you are doing. Um, Tomashi, any, any ending words? For yes. Our well, I know that we're we're getting the, we're getting the boot. Oh, um, hi. Um, so I'm looking in the chat. I'm in the chat. So there's some requests. Uh, I'll get to work right now. Edis, and I'm pronouncing. I don't know if you want me to pronounce this as Iris or Edis. I learned in Greece to say Edis. Um, so uh, the information. I'm looking at some of the questions. One of the questions is share the articles about the land grabs in Brooklyn. So that's at Kings County Politics. Um, um, uh, what is it? Um, Kelly Mena, Stephen Witt. Um, so I'm just Googling that. And then, then, uh, blah, 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 blah. It's called the city real estate scandal. So, um, Kelly is now with CNN, I think. Um, oh, wow. What incredible things were happening. Jeez. Yeah, I, I still, I wish that I knew how I came across this article. One article just like got me completely caught up in their work. And um, there's, a, there's a talk that we did at the Whitney for the education programming for the biennial. Um, it was really good. Like it really like moved us all. Uh, there was a whole panel of uh, city archeologists, scholars. Oh, um, archeologists, scholars, journalists. Uh, it was an amazing gathering of yeah, people. People who would never I'm to roll call call everyone. You know that in a museum, and I call it the performance of truth. Um, um, but it's it's available on YouTube, or if you go to the if you if you search my name, it's one of the videos that comes up. Or if you go to uh, to uh, the the Whitney, it's a really really everything gets explained there uh, as as best we can, and we really felt like it should have been longer, much like right now. So Kings County politics. I'm looking it up so I can drop it in the chat. Um, uh, real estate scandal. I'm looking up the whole like archive um, so that you all can have it. Um, 
Uh, Corinne, can you uh, look? Somebody just posted it. Oh, thanks. No, that's a different one. Okay, I found it. I found it in the archives. I'm copying and pasting now. Okay, great. Um, uh, yeah, I just wanna, I wanna um, uh, just uh, get to some of these questions and express some gratitude for people uh, being here. Hey, Jane Panetta. Oh, <laughs> sorry, but I'm like an old, I'm like an old woman. I'm like, look, there's my friend. There's my friend. All your friends. Ernesto. Uh, Ernesto, one of my former students, said, "I've recently learned about a push in town in, in a town near me in New Jersey to basically obliterate a black community called Hobbstown uh, to build a, a super mall." Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Donna. Um, Thank you. Do you, are, are we, are we done, Tomashi? Do you want to answer a couple more questions or can we I'd, I'd, I'd like to answer a couple more questions. And actually, let me save the chat. Um, okay, yeah. Um. Yes, so the, the conversation continues um, with Tomashi and with uh, the community leaders of the East End. So we're really going to focus on, on the land claim in the oh, next few conversations. Let me drop the Conscience Point film in the chat okay. so that everyone can have access to that as well. Um, and uh, uh, Treva Wormfeld is the, is the director. Um, I just missed a film festival on Long Island right before things got weird where it was screened. Um, so it's called Conscience Point. Um, yeah, I mean, when we do this again, maybe we can just focus on 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 the work for our show um, uh, at at the parish. But yeah, I mean, the notes that I have from our conversations continue to um, I continue to find them riveting. Conscience Point film. Um, the first thing that Corinne told me when I asked her what is happening on Long Island when we started talking about the possibility of doing something together, she told me, this is a couple of years ago, and she told me um, about the increasing, an increase in uh, uh, racial, pro racial profiling of brown people, drivers, being um, stopped and arrested and detained and like shuffled off to ICE detention centers. Um, so yeah, my first, so this issue of transportation and who gets to be safe in, uh, in, the, in the act of uh, moving between spaces, um, transportation, livelihood migration, and housing um, were all, were all uh, subjects that came up in every conversation um, with people who know these communities and who are of these communities of like multiple generations in some cases. Exactly. And, and so we're going to hone into um, these issues deep, more, deep, more deeply in our next conversation. Tomashi, thank okay. you so much. We're getting the food. Every, Bye. Every, every amazing people here. Um, I see it. Love in you, Elka. Um, thank you for coming. Thank you, Iris. Um, Molly, I just, there's so many people in this list. Donna, that Robert. Hi, Robert. Hi, Martin. Thank you so okay. much. Okay, until Bye. next time. Thank you, Corinne. Okay. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone. Thank you.